focus on hitting your goals in every area of your business. Remember, the universe rewards the bold. A leader has to take the risks. So welcome to Wealth on the Beach podcast with Daniel Alonzo. I am your host. I'm excited. This is episode number 56, man. We are rocking. I have interviewed some of the, the greatest minds the the wealthiest people on this planet and uh, today i have the privilege and the honor uh, of interviewing one of my heroes in business known shane for a very very long time and uh just uh it just feel privileged i mean i'm, I'm just awesome i mean you know when when you get to a point where you've kind of done something and then you get to hang out with a bunch of people that you uh, idolized for so many years you know some of the greats the giants and you get to be among those giants it's just uh truly an honor for me you know shane has spent uh the last 30 years as a successful businessman building leaders building millionaires and at 29 he was named one of the top entrepreneurs top 10 entrepreneurs under the age of 30 he's you know, a sought after speaker. He, he's been a seven figure earner for over 25 years. And uh, he, he's, his, his life's mission is to share that God wants you to win and pursue your calling to achieve your dreams that God has placed in your heart. Uh, he's got a beautiful family, his wife, Gina, Shane, Cassie, and Maddie. I mean, just living an absolute incredible life. Uh, hey, Shane, I got one question for you here, buddy. How do you know that God wants us to win, man? Ah, uh, well, first of all, I got to start out by saying you named all those things about me, uh, and I am the single luckiest human being on the face of the planet. You have never met somebody luckier than me anybody that you meet that knows me that's around me will have heard me say that but then they will have witnessed and at some point like you might have some listeners out there and at some point we'll run across each other somewhere somehow and at some point if they get to know me very well and watch very long they'll go you know what that dude i think might be the luckiest human being on the face of the planet now you and i know because we were fortunate enough to be recruited at a young age into an incredibly positive atmosphere full, full of the best coaches. And the founder of the company uh, believed and preached from the stage, which is really rare in business, to say God first, family second, business third. I'll be honest, I, like I just, we, it's, it's kind of amazing how things work out. I have a book that just on the 30th, which is today when we're recording this, goes live on, or went live on Amazon. And the title of that book is called God Wants You to Win. And I spell out in that book exactly how I know God wants me to win, but how I know God wants you to win. At whatever you're called to do. You know, I have friends, a lot of friends in the coaching or self-improvement environment, and after some of them got my book to uh, uh, endorse or read and endorse, you know, one of them started picking up on the theme and started posting on social media. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be a billionaire. And I was like, okay, dude, God doesn't want everybody to be a billionaire. God wants everybody to win at what they are called to do. And only they, in their spirit, in a first relationship, asking a higher power, asking if something out there exists, can understand what that calling is. And then once they're called to it, they feel that, then in the book, I explain why I know for a fact that they can know they're supposed to win at. But the first 18 months in this business, even though I heard God first, family second, business third. And even though I felt like I prayed and got my priorities in order, and in some, pe some people would say I got saved, I 
even though I did all those, I felt those feelings. I still was double minded for about 18 months because people in the world, I would go to try it. I was trying to learn more about scripture, more about a higher power. And I would go and I was so excited about the business that I had discovered because I grew up poor with nothing. And the fact that someone was going to give me a chance, I was excited about it. I was excited about teaching people to be good students of their money. And so I would ask pastors to help me get clarity on stuff. And they would, I had three specific memories that were crushing memories for me where pastors quoted, it was easier for a camel to fit through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get to heaven. Now, I don't, I'm not that bright, but I have a lot of common sense. And in my mind, that was a camel and a sewing needle. And in my mind, I believe all three of those pastors knew I took it that way. If they had any people skills at all, they knew I took it that way. And I would even say, you know, it seems, that seems impossible. And they would say, it is impossible without God. But I did, I would just get frustrated. I wouldn't know. They would finish up scripture with me on that. All things are possible with, through Christ who strengths. Uh, and I would, so I'd leave with a little bit of hope, but I was double-minded. And then I was on an airplane to Europe. And a lady on that airplane, the company had done well enough that we had chart, we had, we had booked the entire airplane. First time I'd been on an airplane that was, it was either nine or 11 seats wide. So it's like a bus, right? You know, and I've never experienced something like that before in my life. And after about 30 minutes, everybody gets up and starts moving around. And I see this lady over there that had a ring on that meant that she was making over $100,000 a year in the company. And she had a Bible that was tattered, torn, not an exaggeration, a minimum of five or six different colors of uh, highlights, underlined, written in the margins. And I went, aha, somebody I can trust that knows this business is teaching people to be good stewards of their money. And. I won't tell all the rest. It's all in the book, and we don't. We're we're on limited time here, and I already took seven minutes on just that. <laughs> uh, but I know what I experienced on that airplane, and then the ninety days after going on that trip to Europe, I describe it in detail. How God will scream clarity, and 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 I don't want get I don't want people to get caught up on the word God even. You know, I'm not arrogant enough to know if, if it's a he, a she, an it, but it's a higher power. How do I know right, that? Right, right. Because I have reached out and used it, and it has helped me and communicated with me clearly. And if people, even if they're not believers, if they'll just challenge and ask and say, I don't know if there's a higher power. I don't know if all, any of this stuff is real, but if it is, show me it's real. Make something clear to me. Absolutely. And I explained Absolutely. how that works. That happened for me. And as soon as it did, at 22 and 23, in a little tiny town called Salina, Kansas, which is literally, if you get out a map, it is the closest town to dead center, United States, north, south, east, west. Smack dab in the middle, only 40,000 people. <laughs> I was Shane. 22 and 23. Shane, and Shane, number Shane. One office. I mean, you know, you. I mean, this is this was an this is an incredible, incredible story. We're we're gonna we're gonna jam through this. I mean, this is incredible, Shane. I mean, first of all, I, I'm so intrigued. I mean, I don't know if I've ever let anybody speak for seven minutes like that before. So, Nine but and a half I, now. I am, I am intrigued, man. I'm fired up right now, man. I mean, so, but what I want to do though. Before we get into all that, Steer me. I want to go back a little bit. I want to go back a little bit because I know 
you grew up poor, man. And right. I know, so I want to know, because I always ask people, what did your parents do? You know, what were their thinking like? And, and how did you grow up as a kid? Were you a good kid, a bad kid? Tell me about your childhood. Um, I grew up, uh, my parents, my mom and dad, uh, my mom was 16 when she got married to my dad, quit high school as a junior in high school. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, graduated from high school, was a welder. Uh, they're both very good people, very hardworking, and they were married and divorced to each other three times. So you can't say they didn't try, right? They tried to make it happen. But uh, by the time I was in second grade, it was over for the third time. And so I grew up in a broken home. We lived, depending on, uh, uh, you know, we lived in kind of a one bedroom crappy little house or most of the time I was with my mother, if I lived with my mother, was in a trailer park. Uh, there's two trailer parks in the town I grew up in. This was the wrong one. This was on the wrong side of the tracks uh, to say. And we were on, uh, we grew up on food stamps and welfare and, well, I, I asked my mom when I was really young, like first grade, when you first start eating hot lunches at school, and my card was a different color than the other kids' cards. And so I asked my mom why. And she said, she's a good mom, right? She goes, because you're special. You're, you're special. And because of you're in a special situation, you have this special card. You don't need to tell anybody about it, but you're special. So I go. And I am a type A personality and even was as a kid. And so somebody in the lunch line, when I pull my card out, goes, why is your card a different color? And I said, well, because I'm special. <laughs> my mom said I'm special and we have some special circumstances. So I get a special card. And it made that kid kind of feel bad. He comes back the next day, we're in the line, I pull out the card and he goes, ha, starts laughing and gathers everybody else around. Shane lied. He's not special. He has that color of a card because his mom and dad refused to work. And our families are paying for all of his lunches because his family can't afford to feed him. So that's, that's a first grade memory that's still crystal clear. So... That gives you a little bit of idea. Now, my mom was a hard worker. My dad was a hard worker. My dad was an athlete. I learned most everything about winning and getting any of my self-esteem through athletics. I was only an average athlete, but I was always the quarterback of the football team and the captain of the basketball team and all state and track, all that stuff, not because I was good, but because my dad had coached me very well, show up early, stay late, and I was kind of the coach's kid in all environments, even though I wasn't. I was that kind of a, the coaches wanted to point me out as, because I was always the first one there and always the last one to leave. Isn't that, I, isn't that amazing, Shane? I mean, you see, I've interviewed so many successful people and, you know, that little trend of the way that winners think, isn't that amazing? Like, yep. You know, we all showed up early, we all stayed late, we all practiced harder than everybody else, we all were more determined, we all were more passionate, we just wanted it more than everybody else. And most of us had those kinds of stories, you know, when, when you were a little kid and they might have made fun of you or, or, or somebody laughed at you or, you know, like for me, when I went into business, my friend told me it was a pyramid and his parents said it would never work and I said, you know, F you, man, I'll, I'm going to do it anyways, you know, and right. it just made me, it just made me want to do something great with my life even more, you know, and so it, it's amazing that, that it's so, uh, it, it, it's so prominent amongst the most successful people in business. You know, you started at 21 years old, man. I mean, you started young, right? In business, yeah. you got recruited. How did you get recruited? And tell me a little bit about, you know, was it tough? Was it easy? Was it, you know, how did it happen yeah, for you? It was, um, here's how I got recruited. My uh, college roommate and you could be twins, male models. And 
That I am not. And so his name was Greg, but his nickname was Bait. Because we would go at, in college, we would go to the bars or go to where all the girls were. They would all be attracted to Greg, to Daniel, and then I could talk to him and at least use my personality to have a chance, right? So Greg's nickname was Bait. That's Greg funny. was from a wealthy, was from a, a, the, they lived in the wealthy part of the little town I grew up in. We, it was a town of only 12,000 people, but they had a swimming pool in their backyard, so they were wealthy because I was living in the trailer park, right? But he was my roommate. Um, and all one semester, I, the last semester of our, our uh, sophomore year, I couldn't get him to go out with me. And I'm going, bait don't work at home. You got to go with me. And uh, we would joke about it, but he wouldn't go. And the reason he wouldn't go is because he was studying for his real estate test. He was going to get his real estate license, and he was going to make all these millions in real estate. And I go, great. You look the part, and people will like to look at you, but you have the personality of a doorknob. You are not going to sell a house to anybody. Wrong choice. Kick it off. Let's go out together this weekend. But he was determined. Right. And he got he passed his real estate test that summer between our junior and senior year, goes to work at the top real estate firm in the town we're at. He's dressed up in a suit every day and I'm delivering ice in an ice truck making four bucks an hour. Now, people think an ice job in the summer, ice cool. No, no. You're taking to ice to all the people that are having fun. You're taking ice to the people having fun in the beach. You're taking ice to the convenience stores. You're working 18, 20 hour days, seven days a week, because that's when ice companies got to make their money in the Midwest is in the summer, right? So I would see Greg in his suit at the convenience store, getting his 32 ounce big gulp while I was delivering the ice to put in his cup and he'd make fun of me. You know, there you are. Look at how you're working, trading time for money. And he'd make fun of me all summer it's the end of the summer and we're all going to have everybody get back together at one time for a party before everybody goes back to their different colleges right i go to greg at the real estate office and go great let's the party let's have it at your house because you got a pool you got the best house let's do it there and he goes man i'd love to but i can't what do you mean you can't he goes and this is it was supposed to be on a friday night and he goes I'm studying for a test. They go, dude, you're studying for a test. You ain't sold one house all summer. You ain't going to sell a house. Here's my 3,500 bucks I made this summer, deliver nice. You didn't make squat. What are you going to do now? Sell life insurance? And the blood just drained out of his face. And I went, oh my gosh, you're going to get your insurance license? And he just dropped his head. And I was ridiculing him in these cubicles in the middle of this real estate office. And the owner of the real estate firm comes up and he goes, Shane, let me show you what he's going to be doing. And he gave me a presentation. And he showed me the rule of 72. 70, rule of 72 blew my mind and pissed me off. I'm not that intelligent, but I can connect A and B that quick. And I, that's why I'm poor. That's why my entire family's poor. The wealthy people know about the rule of 72 and they make sure, how do we not know? And I was so pissed off. I was excited to go to a meeting to learn more. I didn't think I could do the business, but I wanted to get even. And I wanted that, the guy that owned that real estate firm that understood the money, I wanted to teach all my family and friends that, what he was teaching me. I went to work part-time. It didn't take me very long to figure out I ain't never going to graduate from college. This is my best bet. I got to get to where I'm making more money than my parents before they find out I'm not going to school so I can quit and they won't be all that disappointed because I'm making more money than they are. I went to work. A year later, I was a vice president in the company and Greg, the guy that technically would have recruited me, had never been on an appointment. But he wow. passed his test. He passed his test. Wow. Morning. Isn't that me, interesting? Isn't that interesting? To pass my test. Yeah, I mean, but isn't that interesting that 
you know, all these pretty people, they don't get around to doing nothing, right. but they sure do look good. They sure do look, they sure and, sound and good. they're gifted with looks like you and <laughs> all the rest of the stuff, then it's That's just it. a That's but it. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, but, but think about it, right? The, the guy that recruited me, Shane, he quit. He loses $400,000 a year yep. in passive residual income. I mean, in 10 years, just that's $4 million dollars just because he quit. It's unbelievable. Hey, so so what was it like, man? You were making a million bucks before you were 30 years old, man. What what the heck was that like, man? I mean, how was that? You well, know, well how, what, uh, what was your, what was your, what, how did, so you went from 100,000. So tell me about okay. your income increase. What here's, was that like? Here, here's my income for the whole time. My first year, okay. I made, my first year, I made a little over $26,000. That was most of the time while I was still pretending to go to school, all that. Quit school, went full time, made fifty thousand nine hundred eighty my second year. Then one hundred twelve. Then I moved up. Actually, I moved to Salina that year. Then I made one hundred twelve. And so I, I completely relocated four times in the first five years. And wow. the reason was I was in a town of twelve thousand people. Moving to Salina, forty thousand people. There was a rate committed in the past ten years in Salina. That wow. was ungodly for us. That doesn't wow. happen where we're from. It was scary to move to Salina, not because <laughs> there had been a murder there, but because there had been a rape in the last 10 years. Nobody had been killed. Wow. But that was a city to me. So wow. I moved there, there knowing ultimately I needed to get to Kansas City. But I moved to Salina, then from Salina to Topeka, from Topeka, actually, I moved from McPherson to Manhattan, Kansas, where K-State is, then to Salina, then Topeka, then from Topeka to Kansas City. So I made 140 my fourth. Then I moved to Kansas City, made 160 my first year in Kansas City. Then 400,000, then 600,000, then 800,000, then 931, and then 1.2 million. And then it went to 2 million pretty quick. With I have, I have two code numbers, so. Right, right, right. No, that's, that's freaking unbelievable, man. I mean, and so how is the business different today versus back then man i mean is there any do you see major differences i mean how do you there see is. It? i mean the the, yeah. the the industries you know you know as well as we are as i do many people in your audience might not but primary in itself is a hybrid system bo adams is the greatest business people don't even know who bo adams is i got to be with him very early on he is the genius brains behind everything that was created Art Williams, the founder, was the motivation, but the genius was a guy named Bo Adams. And he evaluated all five different ways to systems to make money in America. You know, having a job, starting your own business from scratch, buying a franchise, doing network marketing, uh, independent contractor, uh, status agent, broker kind of thing. He looked at all those and went, let's build towards, uh, let's identify the three best of each one. Let's identify the three worst of each one. And let's build a hybrid business model that brings the three best and eliminates the three worst of every model. And so that's what they started doing before I even got here. Now, one thing where I was lucky because I had a lot of success early and actually the company had kind of stubbed its toe for a little while. And so when I was 25, 26, we had the top office in the country and we're kind of dominating. And so even Sandy Weil, who built the biggest company in the entire world, Citigroup, Travelers, Merger, Primary Corporate, all that, I was involved in building a lot of the stuff for about 10 or 15 years on the inside. And so our, uh, our industry is, has, has changed a lot. Um, our company has evolved a lot where I'm super excited. I actually texted your, your wife in the last day or two about things that I was excited about. I got to be careful about what I talk about because we got a couple things, you know, when you're an inside, you guys, uh, things you can't talk about, things you can't talk about. What I believe is the very, very best of what the, the network marketing thing has happened for them 
the geometric progression people to get people to get people to get people that grow almost uncontrollably that ours I, I did that in the first seven or eight years but then we're in a very regulated business you know all that kind of stuff and we kind of had that hybrid we haven't had the multiples i mean i've made millions and millions and millions without having geometric progression really that much right right what we have done in the last 90 days but what we are going to do in the next year less than a year we'll add the multiples and here's what i believe daniel now this is one of the challenges i believe first of all everybody needs a coach i got so many stories i could tell you about traditional the traditional business owner out there so badly needs to plug in to you or some kind of thinking to get some positive input and motivation. Um, but then there's cross pollinization. There's a lot of people that are recruited into a lot of different things. And, and even John Addison, who was the CEO of our company for 10 years is, you know, speaks to the direct marketers association, mm -hmm, one of their most mm -hmm. sought after speakers, all that kind of stuff. There's a little bit of cross pollinization, but it's going to get dangerous because of what we are doing. I've met with the seven biggest CEOs in Salt Lake of the fastest growing companies out there. And they know when we do what we're getting ready to do, they're going to be bringing over in 10 and 20 and 40,000 people at a time to what we're doing. So I believe it. I believe it, man. I believe it. Hey, hey, Shane, tell, tell me, I mean, as far as, I mean, when, when you look back, how you became so big fairly fast and you dominated the company. When you look back, what are some of the things, if you were to maybe give me, you know, one or two things that you could pinpoint and say, man, I did this and this is what helped me grow. What, what could you, what would you say to that? Well, first of all is knowing that you are where God wants you to be. Like, like in that book, I, uh, when people read the story, I, I resigned from the company. I, I was leaving the company because I thought giving up everything to follow what God wanted me to do was going, that meant in my mind, that was, to, I was supposed to go into the ministry. Now I'd be a pathetic pastor because I can't deal with whiny, wimpy people seven days a freaking week, but I could have been an evangelist, blow in, blow up, blow out motivate some people not have to deal with the whiners and criers afterwards so um i thought when i made that decision that i was going full-time into the ministry and the stories in the book it was kind of like isaac making a sacrifice i it just make I, I it'll take too long to tell on here we don't have enough time but it's in the book which they can all get on amazon but um that honestly is the most important thing. I, when I relocated, I went from having the number one office and being the dude, dude, dude. That was all, I, I, one thing that was a little unfortunate was here's a, at, at the time I'm 23 and 24, okay? At that time, everybody else in the company was about 15 to 20 years older than me, the founders of the company. Well, I was, the hot dot at the time and art williams the founder of the company who was the king of motivation he knew how to motivate people he was shoving me up all my heroes rear ends he was like look what this kid's doing what are you doing you know and so i hated him doing that because i'm like those are my heroes do not disrespect my heroes but he knew what he was doing just like he gave me his freaking yacht for a week right so he, my, my, my fourth date with my wife was Art's, the longest yacht in the United, that flew under the United States flag for a week in the Bahamas. That was my fourth date. Wow. How do you get special permission to go? Because I was the only person ever that Art allowed to take somebody that wasn't married yet. But we oh. were engaged. Okay. Anyway, so bottom line, that key is even though, so I went from being hero, art shoving me up everybody's rear end, 
I moved and I completely moved. I was living on the office floor, taking showers at truck stops because I couldn't afford a place to live and have two offices open at two different locations. I learned, I had a very personality driven business. It could fall apart where I moved from much faster than I could build where I was at. And there was a point that my office, I'll call it our base shop, right? That I get credit for did zero and zero in a month. Wow. And I was crushed. But God reminded me that this was my ministry. This was my calling. I wasn't alone. So to get back, do what I know how to do, put on the blinders, because at that point, there was some un unscrupulous things that people on the outside of our company were doing to try and bring down um, our company. I mean, the, the most deceitful industry in the world hated us. The insurance industry, the bank industry hated us. And Art Williams, the founder, had to step down for a year for uh, under this stupid investigation. During that year, our company went from 225,000 licensed people to 100,000 licensed people. And the public really didn't know all that. We didn't report all those numbers. We weren't publicly traded at that time. Um, but during that period of time, I took my income from 160 to 400 to 600 to 800. Here's the key. I shut off the whole outside world other than plug it into one human being that I believed in that was far, farther ahead of me than where I was, and I trusted what they were doing. And that was Hector Lamarck. I didn't know Hector. Hector didn't, well, maybe Hector knew me because we had the office we did. He knew who I, of my name, but he didn't know me. So here's what I did. I took one guy, and we went out and we're a fly on the wall at Hector's Saturday training. That was it. And, and, by, and by the way, everybody that you're listening right now, Hector Lamarck is one of the most successful people in the history of the company. And on top of that, he's one of my uplines. He's actually, the, the, you know, he's my mentor as well. Uh, you know, we, we, and by the way, I did a podcast with Hector. So if you ever yeah. want to check it out on iTunes, check it out. It's a great, great interview. It's a great interview. So go ahead, continue. So, so anyway, I went out there. Now, I had already, though, done what Hector had taught the whole world to do. You know, he had audios out there. We already had, at that time, clear back in the beginning, we had the largest private and satellite network in the world before this kind of technology existed. And so they were broadcasting live into all of our offices 30 years ago, which is unheard of, right? And so I knew who Hector was, and I've already applied what he taught, which he was talking, teaching Hopkins at the time, and learning word-for-word -word closing. So what I had done before I went to visit Hector is I had taken every Hopkins close there was and converted it from a sales close to a recruiting close. I just converted his entire boot camp to only a recruiting boot camp. And so I knew there was not an objection any human being could come up with that I could word for word quicker than thought overcome and get them to say yes. So we're sitting in Hector's meeting. His staff knows has told him that somebody from Kansas City is visiting, but he has, doesn't know us from Adam, right? And somebody walks in late to the meeting, which in Southern California, everybody freaking walks in late to the meeting, right? Traffic <laughs> sucks there. Right. But somebody walked in and it pissed Hector off. And so he went off on, you're trying to change your life. You can't get here on time. You know, and he just goes off and then he goes, you can't get 10 minutes across town and there's somebody in here that flew all the way from Kansas City and was here an hour and a half before the meeting started. And who, where are you? And I raised my hand. And he goes, tell people why you came out here. So I told him. And then uh, I, I go, I apply what you teach. You know, I, you know, it cost me a bunch of money and time to come out here. I'm here to learn because you're the best to learn from. These folks don't know it just because you're never a, 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 a profit. Can't be a profit. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, you just, they, they just take it for granted. They can't help it. 
but I have applied what you taught and there's not anybody in here that can come up with a objection about recruiting I couldn't overcome. And some of the people in the team, you could tell kind of were stung by Hector shoving me up there in. So they popped off an objection. I overcame it. They popped off another one. They overcame it. They popped off another one. Hector goes, come up here on stage. And I spent the next hour overcoming every objection that the group could come up with. Hector recorded all that. After that meeting, you could tell Hector at that moment, because I had applied all of it, I was prepared. I was properly prepared for that moment. Hector, I don't want to say Hector fell in love with me, but Hector adopted me at that moment. We still had to have a personal conversation. And from there, he said, as soon as the meeting was over, which obviously changed the entire meeting because I took the last hour, right? We went and sat in his office for 30 minutes. He goes, come over to my house for lunch. We went over to his house for lunch. He made us move all of our bags. We stayed at his house the next two days. We became the best of friends. He's the godparent of my kids. And so <laughs> you go back to eight minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, you asked, what was the key? First of all, I knew that I was supposed to be here. I shut out everything other than the one human being that I was going to follow and learn from. And that's all we were going to plug into. I didn't want my people to see or even know what was going on in the company. Right, I right, right. I them on us where we were and going, that, going to Hector's. And, and that's the key. I mean, and, and everybody talks about that is that, you know, when, when the company was even going through some challenges, everybody shut it down. I mean, there are not everybody, but there was a lot of leaders like Hector, you know, shut it down and said, wait a minute, we're not going to look left. We're not going to look right. I don't give a shit what they're doing over here or what they're doing over here. We're going to stay focused. We're going to keep our head down and we're going to go win. Hey, look, I, I want to ask you this, man, because I, I know that you've been, you know, you've had some some challenges over the last few years and, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, you've had some medical challenges. Maybe you, you'll tell us a little bit about that. And, and, but, but I want to know how important is massive, passive residual income, dude. Yeah, I do. I, so the first year I was diagnosed about 10, about 10 years ago now. And then nine years ago, I had a heart attack from it and all this stuff. And I won't go through all the Lyme disease stuff and the things my family have been through and all this stuff. That's a, that's a whole nother crusade in itself. And that's another whole podcast in itself. Right. But. It was amazing that first month I was completely off, not, not talking to anybody, nothing. I was at a medical facility because another person in the business cared enough on their own dime, flew to, they knew I was having, had been having a lot of challenges, a lot of seizures we couldn't figure out, a lot of things going on. They flew to Kansas City, took me to lunch, and I can't say verbatim what they said, but they basically slapped me upside the head and said, shut the f up get in you're going with me on a freaking airplane and we're going to find out what the f is wrong with you and we actually did get a diagnosis we started treating it it was kind of funny that first month i had no contact with anybody uh my wife went and did one meeting she never ever did any meeting she just did one meeting to let people know i wasn't gonna be at meetings okay and our team kind of stepped up but I, I just remember that one, that that first month, the company sent me $183,000. I didn't talk to one human being. I did nothing in the business. And then to be honest with you, for about, uh, there was a couple of times over a 10 year period of time, a couple of times where this disease, we got kind of under control, which we kind of pretty much have under control right now. but. There's windows that I had and I would go negotiate things with other companies that I was trying to help the company launch with new stuff. Um, so there was a couple of times for maybe four months or so that I worked only, so eight months out of 10 years. Wow, wow. And the company still sent me, even in bad months, a hundred grand a month. But wow. that's what the company sent me. That was, right, my, right, right. that was my cash flow. That's not counting all my investments, all my net worth, all the rule of 72 stuff and compounding interest right. 
things taught right. us to do, right? Right, 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 right. I mean, just absolutely incredible. Hey, this is the Wealth on the Beach podcast with Daniel Alonzo. I'm here with the unbelievable Shane Rudman, uh, one of my heroes in business. Uh, known him a very, very long time. Hey, look, we're talking about understanding and, and you know, that you have to. Look, people have to build passive income. They have to build residual income because most people, Shane, they got a job and they're going to get to about 50, 55 years old. They're going to get laid off. They're going to lose everything. The economy is going to go down. Something's going to happen because it's all in cycles, man. I mean, this right. shit happens every so often. And at one point when you lose everything and you got to start all over again, I mean, that is, it, it's impossible. You got to do so, it before then. You got to do it before that happens. You got it. You got it. And if you can find something that allows you to try something part time, I don't care if it's our business. I don't care if it's a wood cutting business. I don't care. I don't care what it is. I don't care what you've got to start having a side hustle that you can build that hustles on its own. That right. once you get it going, it's going. For me, it's just much easier to find other people who have already done that and copy them, you know? That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, that, that's the key. Well, I mean, I, I talk, Shane, one of the things that, that I talk a lot about is that you got to have a process, then you got to duplicate the process, and then you got to sell a vision, man. You got to paint a vision and amen. sell a dream. Of, of, and so if you do that over and over and over again, you follow a process, you duplicate that process, and then you sell a vision Man, I mean, there's nothing that can stop you. And, and by the way, this is any business. This is any business. That's right. Not just the financial services business. This is any right. business people can do this. Any business can do that. But I could tell you a story of something that happened just a couple of weeks ago of why, yeah, any business can do it, but the odds of them doing it are literally one in a million of the one in a million if they don't plug in to an energy source that is constantly keeping them focused and moving the right direction. Um, that's why you coaching, like you naming the for the process, duplication, all that. I am, you know, I was the first person in Primerica to emit the entire business, right? I had a five inch man manual. And I didn't have, the way I got people to believe in themselves, it's very hard. Now, God wants you to win is how I got people to win. That If, if you want to learn how to really get people to believe in themselves, get that book. I'm not just plugging that book. That's just a, a fact. Get that because I teach it all in there and it's way too long to do on here. But early on, I get people to believe in a system. The system works 100% of the time. We would hold up our five-inch systems manual before we started training. This is our system. How often does it work? 100% of the time. All we've got to do is work the system, and the system will work 100% of the time. So I'd get people to believe in the system, and they'd go work the system, not because they believed in themselves, because they believed the system. And then anyway, so just like you're a systems freak, just like I know you made everything duplicatable, all those people out in the real world need to understand if they don't have a prime, if they don't have a system to copy in a business they're in, they need to develop one or go steal one, even from a competitor. And I'll tell you this story, why it's important. If somebody's hearing this podcast for the first time, you have no idea what Fry is and that we were the top performing uh, stock on the Dow when my daughter and I rang the bell, you know, um, to, uh, that's nine years ago now, right? Um if you don't know anything about us or any of these other companies and you're just a plumber or a roofer, I'm going to tell you this quick story. One of the non, one of the things that happens when you become wealthy, you have passive income. You never have to work another day in your life. Um, you can move on to other passions or other callings. One of the things I did was a little over a year ago, I found a thing called Animal Justice League of America. Um, and people can go Google that, and pull it up and learn about it. But it, its goal is to end animal abuse through real accountability. And so we're kind of an extension of law enforcement. Uh, I learned very early on, we're actually working with Warner Brothers. I'll be out there in a few weeks, actually. Um, that's a whole thing. The whole come, on by, let's, thing. come on by, let's have dinner. 
I'll, I'll bug you when I'm out there. So, um, but there's a thing called the link, which is uh, we I, I put a bunch of people on a board, a bunch of medical doctors that are child psychiatrists to do the studies, to get the math, to prove the science. And we know that 82% of the time that an 18 year old or above man, male, hurts an animal in any way, it is a certainty he will abuse a child or batter a woman. It's the number one indicator. So anyway, we're, I do a lot with that. I put people in prison. That, that's kind of my part-time gig. I go, well, that's, by the way, that's the beard thing, by the way. I heard, I heard you've got some death threats, man. Can you tell oh, us yeah. about that, man? Can you tell us well, about that? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about that that leads back to this story. But the, the beard, we did our very first press conference. First of all, I, I never had a beard in my entire life, right? And my son's basketball team, they won a national championship, which was a great deal there in Atlanta at the Trickin' Dome. And that was an unbelievable experience. But they had, they had this no shave November thing going on. And so this is a couple of years ago, and they get me to participate in the no shave November thing. Well, then my wife decides she kind of likes the beard. I'm not really doing a lot of public speaking and the primary thing because of my health stuff. And so I'm like, okay, I grow the beard. Well, then we do our first uh, press conference with this first case of this dog that was shot twice in the head. We caught the guy, I'm gonna bury him, put him in prison. All, we did our first press conference on a Saturday at 10 a.m. By the end of the following Monday, my law firm had nine offers for a reality TV show from A&E, History, Animal Planet, all of them. But part of the gig was I had to keep the beard. So I don't really want to do a reality show. I do want to do documentaries to help and the company we're working on a whole lot of different stuff. That's why I'll be out there with Warner Brothers in a few weeks. But because of that gig, I'm driving around trying to find some corrupt criminals a couple weeks ago, and this dude starts following me. And some of the, I've, I've had a 45 pulled out, put right between my eyes, caught, and a guy screaming, he's going to kill me. And I'm like, dude, I've, I've already died, man. I've already seen the other side. I had a heart attack, near-death experience. I'm happy to go. And I'm happy to go this way because you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life because there's a bunch of witnesses seeing you pull that trigger. Anyway, so I, I'm not afraid of dying, but I need to live long enough to solve these problems. So <laughs> this guy starts, the, they're letting me know that this one case I'm working on a couple weeks ago, I need to wear my vest. There could be some people that would like to knock me off. So I have somebody tailing me around and I get nervous, a little bit nervous. And I finally decide, okay, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to address this guy. So I pull into a quick trip, which here in the Midwest is a high end, nice, uh, convenience store gas station, right? Now they have restaurants in them even and stuff. So when I pull in there and it's packed, there's cars everywhere. This guy pulls in right beside me. And I'm like, well, here we go. I get out and he rolls down his window and he's got a big smile on his face. And the first thing he goes is, it's you. I knew it was you. And I'm not sure where it's going, but I'm, I'm still a little nervous and not as nervous. Long story short, I wind up having almost a 30 minute conversation with the guy. He had come across our Facebook post several years ago. He's a roofer. He owns a roofing company, okay? In 2016, his business partner stole a million dollars of cash out of the business and left the country. It devastated him. He was, you know, down in the mouth, frustrated, didn't believe in himself. He thought he was losing everything and came across one of my posts on Facebook and it spoke to him. And so he started following it and he started, you know, saying, you know what, if I think positive, if that guy's right, you become like people you hang around most. Right, you right, hang of course. Through social media. The guy never messaged me, never talked. All he did was just watch the post. And I'm sure, because when I would share some of your stuff, he probably yeah. went and watched, but he got plugged into a positive environment. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he tells me his story, and in 2017, he saves the company and they do 500,000 business, which is not much for them, but he saves the company. 
Right. But in 2018, he does 5.5 million in business. Explodes. And he's just, he's just, his face, he's just beaming as he's telling me. And he's just rattling through everything. And he just keeps talking. And I'm smiling. And, I'm, and he goes, well, I guess I need to tell you why I pulled you over. <laughs> he goes, first of all, I appreciate what you do at the Animal Justice League. I thought it was you because I saw the badges on your Jeep. But he goes, the real reason I pulled you over is I just want to tell you what I did the last two years. And I go, dude, I'm so proud of what you've done. I mean, because what are you, and I, cause I, I was genuine and sincere. I was. And he almost started to break down at what he wants. Here is a successful 40-year-old businessman out on his own in the tough roofing business. That is almost in tears because he just wanted to hear the words, I'm proud of you, from somebody that I respected, a business leader that I respected. That hit home for me so much that there needs to be more coaches available. And every, That's it. That's every it. human being in America That's needs it. to be plugged into a coach they can relate to and get some positive coaching. We're spoiled. You and I were born into it. Right. Hey, look, let, let, let me just jump in here, Shane. Uh, this, is, this is the reason why I do the Wealth on the Beach Club. You know, people in our business, especially, they go, why is he doing this? Why is he, you know, helping these people for? And what's he, you know, because I get, I get 50 messages a day through my Instagram, through my Facebook. I get 50 I messages a day and they all want me to coach them. And I'm like, well, I got my own damn business I got to build. You know, I got, like, I cannot sit there and like, I'm sure on. you're going to figure out a way to be able to make it okay to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's already, I'm already figuring it out. And, you know, I just, right. you know, sometimes you, you shoot and then oh, you yeah, aim no. later. You know what I mean? But, but, but the truth is, Shane, is that just like you said, there are so many people out there that they are dying for leadership. And even in our big company, we have 130,000 people. Yes, but, but, but there's a lot of people that are lost in the cracks, man. When, when a company recruits 30,000 people a month, you know, like we do. people, yeah, like we do. And we, you know, people get left, left in the cracks, lost in the cracks. There has to be people like you that can get on a Zoom call or, or a Facebook, private Facebook group and talk to hundreds of people at a time yep. and teach them and coach them and mentor them and guide them just like, because like most hector people are not gonna me. exactly that's what i was gonna say it's like it, it, like hector did but you had to fly out to I california to spend, I, I i documented it i spent well over fifty thousand dollars the first two years traveling back and forth to southern california having people fly with me that next time i went I took 26 people with me when I went six weeks later. Okay. Unbelievable. But it paid me millions. But we didn't oh, have yeah. this kind of technology. Absolutely. For so 50 now bucks instead of 50 yes, grand. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So now people can plug into the source. I can guide them and teach them and coach them. And and we've are already two RVPs have already come. They're not even my RVP. Right. They're not even my RVPs. Right. Two RVPs. Cross pollinization, baby. Oh my God, changing lives, man. Hey, look. You know, look, I, look, look. Daniel. Before I forget, no. because yep. I know yep. we're both going to get busy. Yep. yep. Um, Glenn uh, and John Peter all got with me just after the convention and asked me to head up a field led. A uh, group of people like you and Ian and a few people, so that we could write a manual. So, because I, I want the company to be able to endorse what's going on, and, it, right. and, and instead of let it, I want them to. In, 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 I want them to empower people to be able to find leadership outside the normal system that is congruent with the system and they're excited about it so anyway, i just in a yeah no another, hallelujah another week or two i'm going to be bugging you hallelujah for that man we're going to change the world we're going to make such a difference for so many people hey uh you know i i want you to i want everybody i mean because we're winding down here 
I want everybody to make a decision that number one, today you're gonna go out on Amazon and you're gonna buy the book, man. God wants you to win. You're gonna buy that book. Promise me that you're gonna go buy that book. And, and, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna go follow Shane on his Instagram, you're gonna follow him on Facebook, send him a message, tell him that this podcast affected your life and somehow if it did, and, and start connecting with people that have information that you don't. And by the way, look, I'm not saying I know it all, and that's why I do these podcasts. That's a big reason why I do these podcasts. Let me because tell everybody me, how- I'm learning, I'm getting better. Let me tell everybody the very first thing I heard you say that impressed me. I was the guest speaker years ago. You, I don't know how old you are now. You were only 24 then. So how, are you, have you hit 40 yet? Oh, I'm, four, I'm 44, yeah, I'm 44. 44. So this is yeah. 20 years ago, dude, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So I'm out there and I'm the big whatever speaker at this thing, right? And you're a local speaker at this thing. And most of the big hitters don't listen to, I, you were making maybe three or $400,000 at the time, right? And so the billion dollar earners are like, yeah. And I'm like, I'm listening to everybody, but you walked up there and I listened to everything you said. You only had like eight minutes, but you said something that was, the, I'm sure you heard it somewhere else, but you were the first person I heard it from. And everybody needs to hear it on here. And that is the key to success is what you learn after you already know everything. I heard you say that first. And that was an aha moment for me. Right, right, right. People can get stagnant. They got to keep growing. That's it. You got to keep growing. You got to keep getting better. And you know what's funny is the first meeting I ever went to, to in the business, they used to play these VHS videos of the stories of everybody. So that was the first time I heard Shane Rudman. And it showed a picture of your, of the, of the actual, uh, you know, uh, trailer, you know, the trailer oh, yeah. park that you lived in. And it talked about, you made $3,000 selling ice and all this stuff. And I'm going, the tw- there's a 21 year old kid that's making a million dollars a year, man. Unbelievable. Or, you know, a kid that started at 21 and now he's making a million dollars a year. And so you changed my life. You, you probably didn't ever know that, but you know, me being a young kid that, you know, I got laughed at, people told me I couldn't do it. People put me down. People said bad things to me. Uh, I mean, even today, man, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, trying yeah. Shane, man. I mean, I really, I got a good heart. I care about people. I really am trying. And even today you still got haters, man. You still, it well, never you're gonna, ends. And you're, the haters that you get now are only jealous haters. Well, yeah, I'm I'm sure. But but you're right. All those other people get haters. They need to know the power of association is only outweighed by the power of disassociation. I I didn't have a problem burning bridges. And I burnt a lot of bridges early on with family even. Yeah. But when my, I'm going to finish with this quick story, okay? So I burnt bridges. I, I just I didn't I just quit going to family functions where people weren't supportive that I used to always go to. Okay. And they I'd get talked about because I wouldn't go to them. My priorities were screwed up. Shane's out doing his thing. You know, it probably ain't gonna work, but his priorities are messed up. I hear him say God first, family second, business third, but all I see is business, business, business. So I'm getting all that, right? When my grandfather who his father came to this country from Germany and homesteaded a piece of land in Western Canada. I can only imagine they go there, that is 160 acres in the beginning, they improve it, improve it, break the soil, do all the stuff, turn it into a farm, and after two years, it's yours. You get to own it. And I can only imagine my great-grandfather that day, that after two 365-day periods, picking up that dirt, to his kids and shaking that dirt and going, this is ours. This is the first thing a rudiment is owned and it's ours. Nobody can ever take it away, right? And then when my grandfather was 11, his father was murdered over this discrepancy of a pig. 
So my grandfather at 11 is entrusted with the family farm. At 81, he lost it back to Federal Land Bank. He was foreclosed on. Different family members tried to keep it in the family. My dad let me know they were all struggling. I didn't say anything to my dad. I went and got my staff, we pulled it all together, and I went and bought the farm back, paid cash, owned nothing on it, called my dad, who was in Georgia at the time, working, called my grandfather, got him on the phone together at the same time, and said, I just want you to know, I bought the family farm back, I don't need to make any money off of it, it's going to stay in the family until the good Lord comes to take us home. There was a lot of cracking in voices. I couldn't understand my grandfather very well. Couldn't understand my dad very well, but there were some emotional people. At 91, my grandfather passed away. I had made a commitment to do a speaking engagement, and I was speaking to a couple thousand people. I didn't want to let them down. So I had to charter a private plane to fly out to make it to the funeral. So I wasn't at the visitation not the night before, okay? So there were still some other family members. There's Shane again, you know, doing his thing. I got just in time with the, the church. My son was really young. He was with me. We got there just in time for the service to start. My dad, his older brother, all the, the living siblings got together, brought me in the back of the church and said, we were talking like, I don't get emotional about this. We were talking last night about who did the most with the sacrifices that great grandfather and those people that came to America did. And for our family, that was you. So we, we all decided that you should speak on behalf of the family. So I tell that story just so people know, once you make it, everyone will know why you did what you did. Those were temporary suspensions of relationships. I didn't have to burn the bridge all the way. But if I would have kept hanging around them, I couldn't have done what I did for my grandfather and that I did for my dad for doing that for his dad. God bless you for that, Shane. I mean, un unbelievable, man. I mean, and, and I, I so believe that, Shane, that, man, all the sacrifices, I really truly believe that you got to give up to go up, man. Something, you got to give up something. You got to sacrifice, sacrifice something if you're if you want the big time, if you want to make that difference, if you truly want to make a difference with your life, you can't be afraid to do that. You know, everybody, this has been one of the most impactful, uh, you know, podcasts that I've ever, ever put on so far. And uh, I just can't thank you enough. Um, I know you're coming out with the God Wants You to Win uh, uh, series as well. And that's wow. pretty exciting. I'm excited about that. Cause I'll have a story. You're going to you be in that. Well. Then you're going to have a book. I, real quick. I, I, I will have, I, I will for sure. I will be in there. Uh, the, the animal justice league, you guys need to go check that out, but go out and get, uh, that book today. Um, all I know is that this, when you make a decision to build a system like Shane did, to duplicate that, to teach that, to train people, to mentor people, to coach people, to push people up, to treat people good, to, to, to know that God wants you to be here, your life will never, ever be the same. And uh, I just want everybody, again, follow the podcast, follow us on Instagram. We're still signing people up every day for the Wealth on the Beach Club. It's one hour with me with a private Facebook group every single week, uh, Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, one uh, half an hour lesson and a half an hour Q&A. Uh, it's really going incredible. Check out uh, thealonzoacademy.com for more details on that. As always, subscribe to my YouTube channel, lots of free content. And as always, dream bigger than ever, but make sure that you do it now. God bless you. We'll see you at the top.